I know of a grandchild, not mine, luckily, was born with its stomach in its lung. They've saved it. Well, it's a girl, actually. But now she's hyperactive, she's going deaf, she's got lots of things wrong with her. Others with legs, feet sticking out of their knees, um, people with hearts and lungs on the wrong side, extra digits on their hands. Oh, asthmas, leukemias in the children. It, it, you, you could go on forever. Sheila Gray is the secretary of the British Nuclear Test Veterans Association. For years she's been hearing about leukemias and other deadly cancers affecting ex-servicemen, men who witnessed Britain's nuclear bomb tests in the 50s. Now she's being told an even more harrowing story, a catalogue of cancers and deformities in their children. I know of one little boy who was born, he was 10 days old, and other than having webbed feet, he was perfectly normal to look at. And he died unexpectedly, and of course they had to hold a post-mortem. And when they did, they found that each of his organs weighed twice what they should, and he was dual sex inside. That was my first introduction to that. That was going way back to 1983 when we first got involved. And since then, they've come along with varying tales. We know of um, a veteran's daughter who was born with dual sex, and they had to build her into a woman. We have veterans' children, grown-up second generation. They ring me up and say, my father was at such and such a test. I want to get married. Dare I have children? Tonight, we reveal the results of a major Northern Eye investigation into the health of the veterans' children. This is the first time the health records of over 2,500 children of the bomb have been gathered together and studied in detail. The results of our survey suggest alarming levels of genetic damage and raise serious questions about the long-term effects of exposure to radiation. A wedding in South Shields. It's an opportunity for the Reed family to get together, to celebrate, to look forward to children and grandchildren. But for the bride's father, Mike Reed, smiles for the photographers hide a deep concern for his family's future. Mike was at the Christmas Island bomb tests over 30 years ago. Today, he's convinced his children have suffered because of the bomb. The problems began when his first son, Alan, was born. They found that he had a blood clot in the head. What it caused was there was a mine, minute hole in the skull, and as he was growing, it was allowing the blood to seep through, it was forming a clot. So he was given a 50-50 chance of living through the operation he had to go through. Fortunately, he did come out of it okay. My second son, Anthony, was born shortly after I left the services. What happened was that he was found to have a deformed arm on birth. That involved not having these three, three centre fingers. He had this little finger and the thumb only. Once again, I'm wondering what's going on here. This is my second child, problems again. Still naive to radiation. On going through the records of the servicemen who had been on Christmas Island in Australia, just like myself, and seeing the problems what they had, which matched mine, then everything clicked into place. Anthony's first child was born grossly deformed and died within six hours. Then came Stacy. She has cerebral palsy and is partially deaf. She's been in hospital eight times this year, one of many veterans' grandchildren with serious health problems. These other people having the same problems, their children, grandchildren, and probably great-grandchildren now. 
I'm get to fix. I want another kid, but to go through that experience, you know, you just weighing up, is it worth it? I mean, I would like to say I would love a son or an even little girl. Preferably a normal person, as they, what they refer to as to Stacey, where she's a special needs child. Just, if we have a normal kid, it's somebody to look after her, at least, when we go. Norman Kitching was an RAF fireman who witnessed bomb tests in Australia. Two years ago, he was diagnosed as having stomach cancer. Six weeks later, he died at the age of 52. His widow, Betty, often visits Norman's memorial at the local crematorium with her son, Stephen. See, the one in the middle, Stephen. The red rose beside. Stephen is mentally handicapped. Nice words, aren't It's got his full name there. It wasn't until he was about two days old that we realised uh, there was something wrong because as I picked him from his cot, he was having a convulsion. And I sent for the doctor and um, he said it was probably a congenital disease, congenital disorder and we sent him straight over to the General Hospital in Newcastle and um, they said it's certainly a very ill baby but we couldn't tell then, they couldn't tell then at that stage what was wrong. Stephen had suffered brain damage. Doctors said it was a congenital condition, something he'd been born with. Now 30, he goes to a special centre for the mentally handicapped in Gateshead. There isn't a great lot that he does, really. It's difficult to let him go places on his own, just in case he doesn't find the way back, so sort of thing. He loves to go to the centre, mainly, I think, because he has a lot of friends there. What do you think his prospects are for the future? Not good. I mean, when you think about it, he can't hold... He won't, he'll never be able to hold a job down or get married, um, have children the way an, a normal person, you know. That's the only thing. It's it's a shame. I feel he's been robbed of all these things, you know. And who do you blame for all this? Well, obviously the, uh, the, the people that did the tests in the first place because they should have known more about it. Because some of these men were made to walk and crawl and run and sit in the radioactive dust. You know, just to see what effect it would have on them. Well, they shouldn't, um, they shouldn't uh, test men in that, w that way. Britain's nuclear test programme began at Montebello off Australia. 21 atom and hydrogen bombs were detonated over a period of six years. In all, nearly 27,000 British servicemen are thought to have taken part in the test programme. It was pushed through at speed, so Britain could become a major nuclear power. One minute to go. Slowly, the seconds tick away. The memory is still vivid for Thomas Wilson, the first man to step onto the Montebello Islands after the explosion. Like a huge boiling cauldron, the cloud billowed upwards to a height of 10,000 feet within two minutes. They asked for volunteers, 20 volunteers, to enter the island. And the volunteers was you, 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 and you. So. After we had been picked to go on the island, they selected the 20. We went down to the islands, and um, when we got there, we were just given a Geiger counter. We said, what's a Geiger counter? Well, you've just got to watch that pointer go around, and if it goes too far, be careful. 
What sort of protection did you have when you went onto the island? Just an overall and uh, a gas mask, an old-fashioned gas mask, and just an ordinary jungle green hat, which, when sitting on the Land Rover, when we were doing um, the rounds, the hat blew off and we couldn't even pick them up. So we hadn't any head covering anything. Why couldn't you pick them up? Because of uh, the radiation. Led by a group of scientists, Thomas Wilson and the other volunteers scoured the devastated landscape of the island. The samples they collected were later examined for the effects of radiation. The men also studied the damage caused by the atom bomb, which was twice as big as the one which had destroyed Hiroshima seven years earlier. You had gas masks when you were on the island. How much use were they? Useless. Useless. We couldn't breathe. We had to take, keep lifting them up to breathe. As we lifted them up, the condensation blocked the we were viewing, so it, we had to take them off at the finish. So you were breathing the air on the island? Yes, we were breathing the air. At the end of the expedition, the troops were taken to a decontamination ship, HMS Tracker. On board, Thomas Wilson was covered in powders and creams and showered and scrubbed 12 times but trying to wash away radiation didn't work. Do you have any idea how much radiation you were exposed to? Well, they wrote it in my peer book, and um, they said that's what I was left with. What does that mean to you? Nothing, nothing to me, nothing. Did anybody explain what the consequences of that might be? No, nobody. Nobody explained anything. After we, after we finished on the tracker, they just told me to get dressed. And the, the clothes we were already wearing was taken away from me, put in concrete and thrown into the sea. And we just, after we left the tracker, we just transferred back to our own ship, the Narvik. And that was that. Nothing more. Never heard anything more. Dr. Patrick Green has made a detailed study of the risks faced by the men at Britain's nuclear bomb tests. He says, compared with modern methods, the way of measuring radiation doses in the 50s was very crude. That poses problems when you look at what happened in the past, because although you may have measurements for the radiation that people were exposed to, A, they're going to be inaccurate, and B, they didn't take into account all the different types of radiation. So you look at a a soldier on one of the test sites, you could measure the, the direct radiation dose he would have got, but nobody was measuring what they were inhaling or what they were eating while they were there. And that is the, one of the biggest risks, because a lot of dust was thrown up into the atmosphere, that would have come down, food would have been contaminated. Those soldiers were living and working in a radioactive environment. This was the place Thomas Wilson is convinced that the radiation he was exposed to has caused serious health problems for his daughter, Pauline. Soon after she was born, it was discovered she had an extremely rare bone cancer called letter receiver. The daughter nearly died and she went down to nothing. And they just, um, as I said, they, they still can't explain how this disease has been caused. And I still want to find out the problem why and the reason why, which I still believe it was through the radiation. Mind you, the doctors, they said it can only be caused by radiation, this disease. How could a one-year-old baby be exposed to radiation? You know, where would you get it from? They are seen through x-rays, but you never even had x-rays. They said the wife had x-rays, but she didn't even have an x-ray when she was expecting. So you're worried that indirectly you caused it? Yes, I do, yes. yes. I definitely think it did, yes. The Wilsons fear their family's health problems are passing down through the generations. When Pauline was a child, surgeons had to remove a large lump from behind her ear. We're in the water. A similar growth has already been removed from her daughter, Julie. I keep thinking about it all the time. 
no, am I guilty for something I've been ignorant to, or, or should I, should I be watching myself, or should I have I done something wrong? You know. As early as 1911, it was known that the radiation in X-rays could cause cancer. Within 20 years, there were fears that it caused genetic damage too, damage to the genes which passed down from one generation to the next. When the first atom bomb was dropped on Hiroshima in 1945, the immediate effect of a nuclear blast was clear to see. But scientists had already warned that there would be unseen effects of radiation on future generations. They said there was no such thing as a safe dose. Their fears were ignored. As the nuclear power industry developed from the 1950s, warnings about the genetic dangers of radiation were repeated. But studies of people exposed to high doses still showed no firm evidence that genetic damage was being caused. The breakthrough came only last year after Professor Martin Gardner studied workers at the Sellafield nuclear plant in Cumbria. Many children of those workers were suffering from leukemia. Gardner's study linked their illness with their fathers being exposed to radiation. The Gardner report said radiation could damage the unborn child. Gardner was saying the children had fathers who worked at the plant. Both fathers uh, received an amount of radiation in the six months prior to conception and somehow that was statistically linked to the child developing leukemia. So you're talking about a genetic damage, you're talking about possibly some damage to the sperm being passed on and, with, and the, then the child subsequently being born and, and developing leukemia. So you're talking about it's the f exposure of the father and it was a big shock Yeah, now there's your Down syndrome, cancer flag, yes. No, that's quite important. The man who first confirmed the cluster of child leukemias around Sellafield was statistician John yes. Urquhart. Uh, one, one, two, six. We asked him to study Northern Eye's research into the health problems of the test veterans' children. He wanted to see if there were any similarities between what was happening to the Sellafield children and to those whose fathers were at the bomb tests. Such precise data on the veterans' children had never been available before. This is the first survey of its type that's got so much detailed information about the families. It's particularly valuable because it's all on computer and we can call up certain information and, and ask various interesting questions. And when we do that, we find that there is dramatic new information. Our research was based on confidential medical records supplied by the British Nuclear Test Veterans Association. The tragic testimony in over 1,500 files gave Urquhart a unique chance to study the health of the veterans and their children. The two main findings that we found was that there was a higher level of cancer in the people who had joined the association than you would expect. And the second and very important finding was that there was a very high proportion of families, one in four, where the child was suffering from some kind of illness that could be linked to a genetic effect. What do you think are the implications of these results? So far, the results that we've got are very important for three reasons. One is because they are telling the families that, that there is probably a connection with the atomic uh, explosions. Secondly, it has a very important bearing on science finding out more of what's, go what's going on. And thirdly, they actually confirm that the effects of radiation are far more far-reaching and more pervasive than we'd previously thought, and that is worrying. a beautiful sight to watch. We had never witnessed anything like this in our lives. I mean, the first thing that run through my mind was, why do they need such a terrible weapon like this? What they're trying to do, you know, are they trying to kill all mankind with it or what? We were naive young servicemen at the time who weren't given any idea of the danger, future dangers uh, from radiation. In fact, I didn't know what radiation. 
radiation was about, I don't, I'm quite sure a lot of men who I served with didn't, who didn't know the consequences. Mike Reed was one of thousands of British servicemen drafted in to take part in a series of nuclear bomb tests at Christmas Island in the late 1950s. The massive operation on the remote Pacific Island involved men from the Army, Air Force and Royal Navy. It was a race against time. Britain was rushing to beat a possible worldwide ban on the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. In the space of only ten months, six huge bombs were detonated. The Ministry of Defence has always said that those servicemen at risk from radiation were properly protected. The protective clothing worn by people who work in the forward area is worthy of some detailed examination. First of all, we should notice the close weave of the cotton gabardine of which this suit is made. Next, there are the double cuffs and rows of press studs. The cap is normally worn with the peak at the back to prevent activity falling onto the short hairs at the back of the neck. People Those at risk were issued with rubber gloves and protective boots. They also wore film badges on the chest to measure their dose of radiation and carried other radiation monitoring devices. Arthur Johnson was senior nurse at the hospital on Christmas Island. The first bomb, we really just stood outside in shorts and flip-flops. We didn't know what to expect at all. Um, we did have the, the countdown on the tannoy, uh, which told us when to cover our, our eyes. Um, but really, we were told nothing other than that. Um, and then when the explosion happened, um, it cracked the walls in the operating theatre uh, and broke every bottle in the pharmacy. How were the troops affected? Well, quite a few, including myself, um, suffered from diarrhoea, uh, nausea, uh, stomach problems, um, which, of course, were now linked with uh, radiation or radiation sickness. What did you think it was at the time? Mainly the uh, RAF food, uh, fried food. I spent some time going through some of the safety procedures and it's quite clear that on paper there were quite elaborate procedures. The problem was they weren't followed. Whatever people in Whitehall thought when they wrote the pieces of paper, you go several thousand miles away, it was a completely different situation. For instance, decontamination of aircraft. Aircraft were used to fly through the clouds, collect radioactive samples. They were supposed to be decontaminated, one aircraft per isolated area, completely stripped down, the radioactivity removed. Because of the pressures, the rate of firing, you often had two or three aircraft on the, on the patch at one time. They weren't stripped down, so people were working on contaminated stuff continuously. And from the evidence I've seen, they weren't told very much about the dangers of radiation. Because although in 1991 we have a very sophisticated understanding of what those dangers are, in the 1950s, when we knew a lot less, we still knew that radiation could cause cancer. We didn't know how much radiation could cause how much cancer, but we knew it caused cancer. And there was also evidence that it could cause genetic damage. Well, I was about three months pregnant, and suddenly I wasn't. I just had this 
It was like a piece of liver, a triangular piece of liver with a little round knob on one point. And that was a baby, so I've been... To, and I was only 19 at the time. And I thought that's what babies of three-month pregnancy looked like. Then in 1956, a year and eight months later, no, 57, sorry, our daughter was born. Now, she was born with what they call a hole in the stomach. And since then, she was being in hospital with her kidneys. Um, she suffered from asthma. She's had a growth removed from her neck. She suffered Bell's palsy. Um, she had a miscarriage with one of her children. And then in 1967, we lost our last baby. I was six months pregnant. And I was in hospital for some other illness. And I went to the toilet and my baby was born. And I was ill, naturally, and I said to the sister, can I see it before, you know, you take it away, because naturally it was still born. And I looked at it, I said, well, what is it, a boy or a girl? And the sister looked. There was no genitals at all. All there was was like a piece of creamy thread from the front of his bottom. And because he had the face and shape of my husband, we decided it was a boy. And that's the only way we could find out his sex. But I was too ill and too naive to ask why. How did that happen? I met my husband when he first landed back in England from Australia, from the nuclear bomb test. And my one proud boast was, oh, my boyfriend was at the first British nuclear test weapon. I was, it was my claim to fame. And when I think of the years that we boasted about that claim to fame, and then look at us now. Sheila's husband, Frank, went swimming in a contaminated lagoon only two hours after Britain exploded its first bomb at Montebello. He now suffers from crumbling bones, angina, stiffening of the spine and arthritis. He's had a testicle removed, the main artery from his heart replaced with plastic, and he's waiting for artificial knee joints. He also has Francois dystrophy, an extremely rare eye disease. Frank was told the cause was unknown, but he discovered what caused it while being examined by international eye specialists. There was 200 of these so-called specialists, and there were six of us clamped in this room. And after about a hundred of these people had gone through, they decided we'd best have a rest. So they unhooked our heads out of these clamps. And I just had to turn around like that. And on the wall behind me was a row of photographs. Uh, photographs of my eyes about that big. And underneath this, it says Francois Dystrophy caused through radiation. So I asked the, the sister in charge, I said, you think I could have a copy of that? She said, you weren't supposed to see those, she said. And she locked me up again. I said, well, couldn't you get me a photocopy? It's more than my job's worth, she said. But you're not allowed that. When you sort of stand back and look at all this, about your, your own health problems and those of your children, what goes through, through your mind? What do you think about it? Well, I, I, I couldn't honestly say in front of people what I think of them. But I'm very angry. I'm, I'm more angry that I have caused other people to suffer. Because it was obviously through me and this happened. Everybody says <coughs> that the veterans are looking for compensation for what happened. We're not really. All we want them to do is to say, we did that to you, 
We shouldn't have done. We're sorry, and now we'll start looking after you. The Ministry of Defence believes there is no hard evidence of a link between the veterans' ill health and exposure to radiation. Seven years ago, it commissioned a study of test veterans' health. After that study, it admitted a possible link between radiation and only two cancers, leukaemia and multiple myeloma, but said there was no proof. The study, carried out by the National Radiological Protection Board, has been severely criticised. It only looked at veterans who had died, not those in ill health. The details of one in six men were not studied at all. It was based on inadequate records of radiation doses and included many veterans who were at no risk from radiation whatsoever. Studies of American nuclear veterans have also found no conclusive link between radiation exposure and illness. But the US government gave its ex-servicemen the benefit of the doubt. It now pays compensation to veterans with any of 15 different cancers. MP Bob Clay tried to get the same deal for British veterans with a private member's bill, but his bill never got to a vote. It brought it home to me what a huge conspiracy there is in the Ministry of Defence uh, to stop this issue being dealt with. Now I should say that even if that bill had been successful, it was only dealing with a small part of the problem. Because apart from the uh, cancers that the American legislation covers, it's absolutely clear to me that there are many other things, for instance, cataracts, various uh, bone diseases and so on, that our test veterans are suffering from. I'm familiar with a lot of the veterans themselves. You go to meetings and you hear them talking about who they've lost over the previous six months or a year. When you start looking at the effect on, on children, uh, it, it's quite terrifying and you just wonder how far it all goes. Give me an E-string on there, Donna. Until now, no one has carried out an in-depth study of the nuclear veterans' children. But tonight, Northern Eye can reveal the results of a six-month investigation into their health. Statistician John Urquhart validated our survey. Same pattern again with the child. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, and this actually came from the father very recently. There's another melanoma. Yeah, that's a different melanoma. That's incredible, isn't uh, it? Yeah. yeah. The health details were analysed, double-checked and fed into our computer. We studied the records of 1,147 members of the Test Veterans Association who were fathers. These men had 2,544 children conceived after the bombs were tested. Of these children, 265 had cancers, deformities and other conditions which could have been genetically passed down from their fathers. That's more than one in ten. But was there a danger of bias in our sample? Had people only joined the Veterans Association because of death or child illness in the family? Urquhart looked at test veterans who had joined in good health. That sample couldn't be biased. The most important test that we did on the cancers was to look at the men who joined in good health and see whether they got cancer later. And we, what we did was we got a list of men who developed cancer after they joined. And we found that there was an excess of cancer over what we would expect. And that was particularly true in the younger men. For the men who joined before the age of 50, we would expect about between two and three cases. In fact, we got 11 cases in the last five or six years, which is four times what you would expect. And the probability of that happening by chance is one in 10,000. So it's a very dramatic result, that. What did the survey reveal about the children? Again, we had a problem. We didn't know whether these uh, families had joined because they had malformed children. So we looked at the problem in another way. We looked at the children who were the first child to be conceived after the test, and we looked at subsequent children. And what we found was, and it was a very, this is a very important result, we found that the first child to be conceived after the test had a much greater chance of one of these illnesses than in subsequent children. Last year, Professor Martin Gardner had linked radiation to leukaemias in the children of Sellafield workers. 
His theory was that a high dose of radiation damaged a father's sperm. Northern Eye's investigation suggests something even worse, that children conceived soon after their fathers returned from the bomb tests may be suffering from a whole range of diseases and deformities. We had this increase in congenital malformations and other genetically linked diseases in the first child after the uh, tests. And that is very, very important because not only is it important for the families who are worried and want to know why their children have got these genetic effects, but from a scientific point of view, it advances the argument. For a second expert opinion, Northern Eye took its research findings to the Centre for Industrial Safety and Health in London. The centre does research into the health risks faced by groups of workers and their children. We asked Claire Marie Fortin to investigate the rare cancers we found among the veterans' children and analyse the wide range of congenital conditions found in our study. There appeared to be, in this set of data, an unusually high occurrence of congenital malformations. We know that congenital malformations sadly happen in the general population. We know that cancer is a disease of the 20th century and we know ev someone who's died of it. So there are cases of cancer, congenital malformation, diseases, you name it, that already exist as part of the background of our lives. And so what I was actually looking for was an increased occurrence of those particular events. Fortin tested our findings on congenital abnormalities to make sure they weren't biased. Our results came from the children of 1,100 veterans. Fortin studied those results as if they'd come from the children of all 27,000 veterans. This meant the number of abnormalities was diluted over 20 times. She still found the rate of most abnormalities was higher than normal. I thought, what if this had come from another occupational group? I'd have been shocked. I wouldn't have expected that scale of... That range, actually, is the word I'm looking for. That range of, of experience amongst the offspring. What stood out in the results of the survey? I think the most significant result in that survey are, in fact, the adrenal cancers. There were four adrenal cancers, two of which were neuroblastomas. Now, they're actually quite rare amongst children. And as a result, the fact that there were four in such a small group is quite astonishing. And so I wanted to test that and to see if it was really as astonishing as it seemed. Again, Fortin applied the severest test to Northern Eye's figures in case our sample was biased. We had found four adrenal cancers in just 2,500 children. Fortin assumed those four rare cancers had been found in a study of all the veterans' children, 67,500 of them. This total number of children was a deliberate overestimate. Even when measured in that much bigger group of children, the number of adrenal cancers was eight times higher than normal. That's an amazing statistic. Now, again, one has to be very careful because we don't know if these adrenal cancers were primary cancers or secondary cancers. A lot of research has got to go into this again. But just on the face of it, those cancers are quite alarming. Bells should be ringing somewhere that there's a real problem here. What do you believe are the implications of these results? Well, obviously we've got to have a national survey to, to confirm these results. But it's got to be done by a body who is, who is seen as being totally uh, independent. And, that, and it's got to be done in a detailed way, in a way that people can understand and accept. And I think if that is done, uh, then I think we would have done something very important. Are you going to take them off the telly? Who's that one? Who's that one? Yeah. That makes me wonder what the situation will be like in 100 years' time. Among the nuclear test veterans' children, their great-great-great-grandchildren, what is going to be the true effects, say, of 100 years' time? No. <laughs> Not just us. Nuclear power plant workers, it's happening there as well. We just the... We, the forerunners, should be taking an example of what's happened to us and make sure it's not going to happen to anybody else. Oh, 